three, two, one. Never has there been a better time to be alive in human history. If you're not feeling it, you must discover why. Join Matthew Bolton in developing and applying a framework of objective optimism toward a flourishing life of meaning, health, and happiness. Here's your host, Matthew Bolton. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mr. Brightside. I'm Matthew Bolton. Today's show is an interview with guest Jason Crawford. Now, before I even started this podcast, I always knew I would want to do a show that makes the case uh, of the opening line to the intro of this show, which is never has there been a better time to be alive in human history. Now, Jason uh, quickly recently became my first choice and I sought my guy and I landed my guy and he delivered uh, 10x. So uh, I just got uh, done recording the interview and I'm still excited about it because, um, you know, you'll see yourself if you're not impressed with the wealth of knowledge and perspective uh, with the knowledge that he has about the history of technology and how it actually affects human lives and how human lives have gotten better, uh, which is what the goal of the show is. I want people here to please um, observe and listen to what's going on in this, what he talks about, and think about your own life and, and what it actually means to have been uh, living in a different time. Because that's what uh, that's what the goal of it is for me. This is what I try to do in my own life, and I talk about that at the end. I just think after all that he lays out, if you do not come away feeling great about the time we're living in about your own life, um, and at least the possibilities for your own life. Um, after this, I don't really know what else I can do for you um, because it was just uh, very impressive. Um, I actually mentioned to him, I got a little bit frazzled actually because all my notes that I had, I just, you know, I was trying to keep it organized, but uh, he was just, he just went and covered everything that I might even want to ask him uh, off one little lead. So I was just, um, just to enjoy myself immensely sitting back and watching. And I think I'll be looking more forward to watching it again and, and listening again and, and uh, really getting more. So I think if we, we listen in with a focused mind, you're gonna get a real lot of value out of his perspective. So while the underlying theme is uh, the history of technology and how it's made our lives better, we also do uh, discuss specifically his exciting and promising new program, Progress Studies for Young Scholars, which he'll tell you all about, and I think is one of the most exciting things going on because of when I talk to students and people around me, I think there's a lack of appreciation for where we are today and how unprecedented it is. And a lot of that has to do with a lack of information about the history, and I think this course um, will provide that and more. Um, we also discuss the importance of funding models, which is something Jason is very interested in and how important funding and financing is to progress and all the things that we owe our lives to and the, and the goodness of our lives. So there's all that and a little bit more and uh, I guess we'll just take it there right now, everybody, enjoy. All right, everybody, welcome now to our interview. I'm with Jason Crawford. Jason is the author of The Roots of Progress where he writes about the history of technology and industry. Previously, he spent 18 years as a software engineer engineering manager, and startup founder. He has also recently launched the Progress Studies for Young Scholars program, which is an online program of guided self-study in the history of industrial civilization for high school students. So thanks for coming on, Jason. Oh yeah, thanks very much for having me. All right, good. So um, I certainly want to discuss your promising new program for young scholars, but um, I'd like to just cover a couple other things before we do that. And first, while I'm likely, I'll likely have mentioned this in the intro that, that I've done, I want to say at the start of this uh, particular interview that the opening line uh, many people are familiar with with my show is never has there been a better time to be alive in human history. And when I had that recorded, I gave a note to the voiceover guy that while it sounds really dramatic, never has there been a better, all that, I said, just please say it matter of factly because that's the way I see it. So um, I'd like to, uh, you know, have, have you help me make that case today that it is just a matter of fact that it's the best time to be alive. What do you say to that? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think you can see it from, you know, simply uh, all of the statistics, the best, you know, the single best compilation of this, I would say, is Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now. 
uh, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress, where he goes through chapter after chapter, uh, chart after chart. He's got dozens of, of charts and metrics in there to show you um, in quantitative terms, uh, as well as with many qualitative descriptions of how life has gotten better along so many different axes. Um, a lot of that data also taken from another project that I'm involved with now, uh, a, a website called Our World in Data, which is dedicated to uh, research and data to make progress against the world's biggest problems. And it's a, basically a global development site, again, full of data and, and, and essays on um, you know, all of the ways uh, in which the world has gotten better and including the ways in which there's still you know, a, a long ways left to go on many axes. But if you look at um, simply, uh, obviously, economic metrics such as um, income and GDP, if you look at health metrics such as life expectancy or mortality rate, um, especially child and infant mortality or maternal mortality, um, you look at infectious disease rates, um, and you look at the technology that we've created to improve all of these things, if you look at um, uh, one of my favorite uh, bits uh, uh, along these lines is um, what they call isochronic maps. These are maps that have lines on them drawn to show you how far, so from a given starting point, say New York City, in a given year, say 1800, how far could you get away from New York City in a day, two days, three days, a week, a month? Um, in 1800, it would have taken you months to cross the United States. Uh, to go from New York City, let's say, to San Francisco, because there were no cross-country roads or rail lines. The first transcontinental railroad in the United States wasn't completed until, uh, I believe, 1869. And so it was, you know, months of, of long uh, journey. If you wanted to get across the Atlantic, of course, to go from New York to London, let's say, that's also months and now, you know, months at sea instead of on the road. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. So just in, in all these so many, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but in, in so many ways, um, our, our lives have gotten better uh, and we've gotten healthier, happier, um, more richer, frankly, and more uh, and just more capable and more able to control the world around us. Right. I, yes. And I uh, hear you talking about time and that thing. And I want to highlight that as kind of the, the currency of of life that we're all trying to seek really in our individual lives is more time. And this is what uh, technology and progress affords us. Um, I want to maybe a, a way to kind of slow down and highlight some of these and maybe bring it to how it affects our individual lives. Um, I want to refer to uh, your Twitter thread, which was where I really got, which really catapulted you to the top of my list to have uh, people on it to make this case. I was aware of you generally and I liked your work, but uh, somebody shared it maybe on Facebook or something. And it was a New York Times opinion writer tweeted some question with a comment. And then you came back. Your first tweet was, oh, good Lord, we have so much work to do. And you proceeded to, you know, deliver an epic 30 or something tweet uh, thing of just listing off things like you did. Um, can you can you give us your recollection of that? I do have the quote here if you need it. But can you give us your recollection? Yeah, Why sure. Did you um there was a panel, uh, some panel of, I think, yeah, New York Times writers or, or a New York Times writer was on the panel. And he said something like, uh, I can't think of a major problem in our lifetimes that tech has solved. Yes. Uh, and I looked this guy up and he's like 47 you know, years old. And so he was born in 1973 or thereabouts. And I just started, you know, rattling off uh, and with a little bit of quick research, kind of what are all the things that have improved in our lives since, since 1973. And there's an enormous, in fact, uh, I, I found so many major things that either were discovered in that year or projects that began in that year. I almost felt like 1973 was some sort of, you know, pivotal junction in the, uh, you know, invention space time continuum. We had like the GPS system, um, you know, pro, uh, project was began, begun in that year. Um, some of the fundamental protocols of the internet were worked yeah. out, uh, I think, in that year and maybe the year before. Um, some, you know, uh, pivotal things in genetic engineering. Um, the Some of the very first uh, databases, and, and of course, databases today power virtually all of our, you know, pr pretty much every software application you use of any type uh, is has some sort of database behind it. Etc. Okay. and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, there was a long list, and so I just went on for as many, as many tweets in a Twitter thread as I could get off. Yeah, right. And, and I'm going to share a link to that uh, Twitter thread uh, on the, on the show notes, but um, 
I just want to wouldn't mind taking a few of those tweets and highlighting them, and maybe you can elaborate on what you what you meant specifically. And and of course, sure. I'm I'm really interested in each person to understand, appreciate how it actually makes our own lives richer, like as we speak every day, and how we can really feel it in our lives day to day. That's kind of where I like to go uh, with it. Um, one one of your tweets said communication is fundamental to our species, and then you said uh, the the immense value created for the world is the greatest communication platform ever invented. So what do you, uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I, I mean, first of all, just on the value of communication, I don't even know how to summarize it. It's obviously something we've been doing for tens of thousands of years, at least maybe, uh, you know, in some ways gotta be hundreds of, you know, back to the very beginning of our species. We've always, uh, been a social species, uh, even, you know, our, our non-human ancestors lived in tribes and the earliest humans we believe lived in tribes. So they lived together, they worked together, um, they, they must have cooperated. Um, so, so communication and, uh, and ultimately the development of language uh, were, were absolutely fundamental to our species. Um, you know, the, the major developments in this, like the invention of writing is the, is the beginning of history and is the, uh, you know, and was, and was, was foundational to how we uh, managed civilization. The development of, uh, you know, Gutenberg's movable type, uh, the more efficient printing press that allowed, uh, you know, printing to to become much more efficient and cheaper and allowed for an explosion of books and writing and letters, um, you know, that helped create um, the, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Uh, and to, you know, in the, and in, within our lifetimes, uh, certainly within, within my lifetime, uh, we've seen the development and growth of the greatest communications platform ever invented, which is the internet, um, which, you know, you and I are using to speak right now across, I'm not sure how many thousands of miles of, of time and space. I know. And I don't know how many People, they, they do appreciate, but don't really feel it day to day. Um, you did mention on, in regard to the internet too, um, on that tweet, you said, surely a New York Times opinion writer is aware that the internet was developed within their lifetime. Maybe they just can't think of any way that this solved a major problem. Pardon me if I suggest that this is a massive failure of imagination. And that's what, um, what explains this failure? Do you have... <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a tough... I think yeah, I, um, you know, my best guess is I think some people, especially today, are just so focused on the risks and harms of technology. Okay. Which are real. Yes. Uh, no doubt. That, but, but they're, but they're so focused on them that it crowds out in their minds the room for understanding the benefits and the opportunities and the potential. And I think to have a full understanding of technology and its role in human life, we need to understand both fully. We need to understand both the benefits and the harms, both the risks and the opportunities and okay. um, consider them fairly. And I guess that's why you talk a lot about the what before the why. Is that what you mean? Maybe we have to understand. Um, yeah, I talk about the importance of um, understanding the basic facts of history yeah. as a foundation to discussing any more, anything more theoretical, um, whether you're a fan of progress and you want to start uh, discussing or debating about what causes progress and where it comes from, or whether you're worried about progress and you want to start talking about uh, the risks and how we uh, can create uh, safety, you know, for ourselves. I think that, no matter which of these topics you want to talk about, an understanding of the history and, and the simple facts, the, the stories uh, of, of how we got here are essential. All right, great. Um, another, back to these tweets, one, of, one you mentioned about marketplaces and the evolution of them. And I talk about this kind of thing all the time. Of course, trade is win-win. So to the extent we can facilitate more trades, we're just adding to everything. And now we can trade at lightning speeds with billions of people. So that explains the wealth to me in, in this way. So, and it's not just, oh, GDP, and you can argue this and that. I just mean more stuff is in the world. It's just overflowing in, in effect. So how do you imagine this process of trade or marketplaces and uh, how have they evolved and what does it mean again for human lives, for marketplaces yeah. that have evolved? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, marketplaces are, you, you know, 
a, a, a key part of marketplaces is the communication, right? It's buyers and sellers discovering each other, learning about what um, they have to offer each other, and uh, and then commun- and then ultimately actually making deals um, and and closing sales. And a lot of that, obviously, part part of that is physical. We're exchanging goods uh, a lot mm-hmm. of the time, uh, but some of it is not. Some of it is just exchanging information and services. And the, you know, the information is really fundamental to all of it. So the internet then as the greatest communication platform ever invented is also the greatest marketplace ever invented. Right. Um, it is a global marketplace that connects everybody, uh, virtually, virtually everybody everywhere all the time, instantly and essentially for free or for rather for zero marginal cost in economics terms. And, uh, you know, I think this is open up Essentially, uh, you know, it's, it's, if you think about, for instance, what happened during the age of discovery, um, starting the 1400s and into the into the the centuries after that, as we opened up the world, as we discovered the world, as we mapped and charted it, uh, the bo- both the geography and the routes of how to get there, and we started sending ships all around. The exchange of goods and people and and knowledge uh, really began the process of globalization. And, uh, you know, the internet, in a sense, has completed the process of globalization. It's, uh, it's connected all of us um, like never before. And this has just so many effects. I mean, for one, as a consumer, essentially virtually every good anywhere in the world is now accessible to you, um, you know, so quickly. And, and, you know, I mean, I find this personally for my work. I am constantly looking for books. Um, and I'm constantly looking for relatively, uh, often relatively obscure books, books that I'll find online uh, that are long out of print and that I'll find online for used sellers. And there's literally, it seems, four copies available. And as far as I can tell, these are the four worldwide copies wow. you know, of, a, of, a, <laughs> of a book. And, um, you know, just, to, like, just imagine what that would have taken before the internet, right? I, I, would, be, I would be ducking into used bookstores every chance I get, right? Every city I ever went to, I would go to, I would go to use book, and, you know, and people used to do this. And today it's, that's still a very fun pastime, but ultimately we just have so much better ways of finding these things. Yeah. I, I remember in the, have to imagine in, the it. Yeah, <laughs> we know. in the late, in the late 1990s, um, I became a fan of a particular uh, music composer, uh, Nobuo Uematsu, who actually, a Japanese composer who writes music for, actually for video games. Um, it's, it's very good. It's, like, it's symphonic music. It's like a movie, it's like a movie score. And uh, a friend of mine in 1997 or so was taking a trip to Asia. And I asked, please go to record stores and see if you can find any music by this guy. Mm-hmm. I don't have to do that anymore because not only is the music uh, available, you know, the music, of course, by, by the uh, 2000s became available on the in online CD markets, and now it's all streaming. Now it's just on Spotify. You just type his name in to Spotify and you've got his albums. That is um, unbelievable, yeah. But I think the be- you know, one of the best things about this is not only, this is not only the benefit on consumers, but it's the benefit on producers. Um, and especially the benefit on small producers, because if you are one of these niche producers, maybe uh, uh, somebody who makes handcrafted arts on Etsy.com uh, yes. or some, you know, musician with sort of a weird uh, niche, you know, you need a certain minimum number of customers, of patrons out there in the world to sustain you and, and support you and to let you make a living doing your craft or your art or your, you know, whatever it is. And today, you know, if if you need maybe a thousand customers uh, to 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 sustain you or something on that order, those you know to, to, today those thousand can be low can be scattered across the globe, right? They can basically be located anywhere, and you can find them, and they can find you uh, through algorithms, through data, through social media, through aggregators, uh, and they can come together and you can get your product to them wherever they are. And so it enables uh, many more people to actually practice their craft or their art or their niche, whatever it is, or their, uh, or, you know, a market for a, so a, a book on an obscure topic. So it could be an intellectual maybe who has a niche. Um, and, and it just opens up the chance for so many more uh, people to do this. One of the best books on this particular phenomenon, by the way, is the book, The Long Tail, 
which okay. came out, gosh, about 15 years ago uh, now. By, right. the, the Long Tail by Chris Anderson really explains this phenomenon okay. um, and, and how it works. Okay. Uh, so I suppose this sounds like a lot to do with what you talk about. You mentioned uh, spiritual enrichment you referred to in one of the tweets. And, um, oh, yeah. and this is my main focus here. I'm talking about it again today. You know, when I talk about human flourishing or, you know, eudaimonia, you know, a state, uh, an integrated state of, um, you know, health, prosperity, and happiness. And the prosperity we're talking about is the material prosperity we're saying is just made so possible by our ability to communicate and trade like never before. Um, including the, and also being empowered by the technology and energy to do it, to, to bring it into existence. But, um, and we know that health is a function of wealth, so that's taken care of. But what about this happiness part? And I wonder, like, and I know you're more than just a big tech guy and a big history guy. You're, uh, you know, this is why I've got you here. So what, how do you think of the relationship between the material and the spiritual? And what do you even mean by that when you say spiritual enrichment? Yeah, sure. I think uh, material and technological advances improve our ability to live a more spiritual life in ways that are rarely appreciated or called out. Um, okay, so let's just take a simple example, art. Okay. Today, again, virtually anyone has access to an enormous range of, of art that you can experience online. Uh, you, uh, paintings from all over the world and all throughout history, um, sculptures, at least images of them, if not quite the full 3D experience. And we might get that full 3D experience someday, by the way, with virtual, tech, you know, virtual reality technologies. Um, music, of course, again, the, you know, the entire world full of music available uh, at your fingertips uh, for, for a flat monthly subscription fee. You know, this is truly amazing. Uh, and you think just a few hundred years ago, you know, before there was, and not even a few hundred, so uh, the phonograph was invented in the late 1800s, right? So that's about 150 years ago-ish. So before that, you know, if you wanted to hear music, you had to hear somebody playing it live, right? Yes. Uh, and so you either had to go to a concert, right, or, or find some musician playing maybe on the street, or you had, to, if you wanted to hear at home, you or a friend or a relative had to be able to make the music yourself. Um... And, uh, you know, if you watch, if you watch like Victorian period pieces, you know, they're all, there's always, they have these parlor scenes and it's always like, oh, the, the young ladies go to the piano and they play the, right. It was just like a thing you had to do because otherwise you didn't have any music. Where are you going to get the music from? Mm -hmm. um, and today, so like, not only can you, can you hear the music without having to be able to play it, but you can hear the best recording ever by the best artist who ever recorded a piece um, no matter when and where they recorded it, if they did it for a, a you know, um, a, a stadium full of a hundred thousand people, or if they recorded it in a studio with, with two people there, it doesn't matter. There are recordings available. If that artist is long dead, if the music isn't performed anywhere anymore, cause it's some niche that only you care about the yeah. recordings are out there and you can access them. Um, so all so, okay. So access to art is just through the roof compared to even what Kings and emperors could have, um, you know, thank you. Two centuries and, and generations ago, right? When their favorite when their favorite musician died, they could no longer hear that musician perform. Nobody could, and now we right. can all continue to hear them perform. So that's a huge thing. Um, but you know what else? And, and, oh, and obviously literature. We have access to all of the you know, and some of it, and so much of it is free online. There's Project Gutenberg. Everything that's out of copyright is now up, and so much classic literature um, is up there. Um, but think about what else? Friends and family, right? the ability to go and visit friends and family wherever they are. You might live across the country or across the ocean and you can still, most people can still get back and visit their family at least once a year on holidays and everybody can be together. And it doesn't take a two month arduous and dangerous journey across the Atlantic, you know, to get back and see. Um, by the way, what about, uh, while we're talking about travel, what about just the ability to travel the world and to see to experience other cultures, to see other countries and cities, right? To meet people of, of, you know, all different races and religions, to see the cultural heritage of the entire world. That's something that is broadly accessible today to at least the middle class, let's say, um, which used to be a, a luxury of the rich. Um, and even when we can't visit people, we can at least have live face-to-face -face conversations uh, you know, people, who, grandparents who are apart from their grandchildren, while the grandchildren can be held up to the camera and to the iPad, they can see, you know, multiple photos a day uh, of their, of their grandchildren getting posted on social media. Um, 
And, and all of us can really have uh, a, a much wider and geographically uh, more dispersed network of, uh, you know, of, of friends and family than we other, ever used to. Or if we need to escape our, our family and our social circle, think of the people who live in oppressive cultures. Um, think of, you know, gays who live in cultures where homosexuality is, uh, is taboo or even illegal, right? And in, just think of the, what the, the, the internet gives them in terms of a, a release, an escape, uh, finding a community uh, of people who, who understand them and accept them. Uh, one of the charts that I posted in that uh, Twitter thread was about how people meet their, uh, their romantic partners and their spouses, uh, ultimately. And uh, what we have seen is the rise of online, online dating, right? People, it used to be often people met through church or family, and then maybe in more recent decades, they started meeting through work and bars. And now uh, there's now there's this uh, this skyrocketing of of online dating where people can they aren't limited anymore by any artificial uh, geographic or cultural restrictions. They can find the perfect match for them. You know anybody anywhere. And if you look at the charts, uh, this is especially skyrocketing for uh, for same sex couples. Right? There's, it's just yeah. so much. Um, Easier, both just in terms of, of finding the people when you're a minority. Uh, how do you find other people in the same minority? And also, again, you might not be able to or be feel comfortable doing it in public, and this you know gives you a way to have your to have your privacy. So for you know for all of the the concern over uh, how uh, technology and the internet have invaded our privacy, and there are real concerns there. There are also really crucial ways in which. Uh, the internet has allowed us to pursue things completely in private from the privacy of our own, of our own homes and bedrooms that, you know, previously we weren't able to do. Oh my, well, you nailed that one. I guess so much for the relationship between the material and the spiritual. And you see me kind of scanning around here. I've just, you're just knocking off all kinds of points I was going to ask you about. And uh, so this is excellent, Jason. Um, what about then marketplaces uh, for work? Just I want to highlight this one because it's, again, something that, you know, you said people can work from home now because of the internet. Imagine uh, single parents or other caregivers to whom this is a lifesaver. And of course, now in, in, uh, in the context of this pandemic, right, we can see that the, that process has been expedited. And what might have things looked like for us in this pandemic had we not been empowered by the internet and other technology um, would we have been better off kind of in a more natural state instead of this artificial one we've created, which, you know, again, people say is material and nothing to do with spiritual life and, and that. So how can you go off on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think it's clear that the, you know, the internet has provided during, during a global pandemic, the internet has provided a safe and sanitary you know, form of, uh, of connection, right? Yeah. Both uh, for both professional, intellectual, social, um, you know, of, of, of all forms, it's given us a way to keep a subset, only a subset, but to keep a subset of life going in a way that, yeah, would, would simply have been impossible. Right. Excellent. Um, I guess I'll maybe last one on the tweet, perhaps. Um, I, I just think this is just an excellent illustration of, of empowerment through technology. And you uh, tweeted kind of uh, relating to Sundar Pichai, growing up in South India in the 80s, you'll mm -hmm. probably recall this. Uh, he remembers his life as pre-phone and post-phone. And you shared a quote of his, and, I'll, and if you don't mind, I'll just share it right now. He says, growing up in South India in the 1980s, I had scant exposure to technology as we see it today. Yet what we had made, uh, what we had, excuse me, made a profound impact on my life. My father was an electrical engineer in Chennai, a great metropolis, but we lived modestly. The waiting list for a telephone, a rotary dial model, was three to four years. I was 12 years old when my family finally got one. It was a big event. Neighbors would come to use it. And for listeners, remember, this is the 80s. I remember my life as pre-phone and post-phone. That one device changed so many things. Pre-phone, my mother would say, can you see if the blood test is ready in the hospital? I would catch a bus and ride to the hospital and wait in line. And often they would tell me, no, it isn't ready yet. Come tomorrow. By the time I rode the bus home, it was a three hour trip. Post phone, I could simply call the hospital and know the results. Now we take the technology for granted and it gets better every day. But for me, there were these discrete moments before and after that I will never forget. So we talked earlier, like this is a great demonstration of what we said about time being the currency of, of what, I, what I said is time is the currency we're seeking. And I say that a lot. Um, 
and not even say, you know, this is why people want to pursue money. Uh, people want money or financial freedom because what they want ultimately is time freedom. And, you know, that's, it, it buys us the time to do the things we want to do instead of doing the things that we have to do. And you can see it here. So, um, how do you think of this and are there more, well, I guess you already gave so many examples of how time is saved, but time really is what we're trying to, what we need in order to pursue spiritual values and every other value that makes our life worth living. So um, how is, I guess, time, how's that yeah, connected absolutely. to spiritual enrichment? I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, and, and again, um, the connection of the material and the spiritual here, one of the big stories of the Industrial Revolution is that, uh, and, and the last hundred years or so, is that uh, working hours have actually come down a lot. Yeah. So the we take for granted today that we have a 40-hour work week and we have a two-day weekend. And people didn't always get these things. Um, it used to be common to work six days a week, not five. Um, you know, six if you were lucky, you got a day off. Yes. Right. Uh, it was common to work 60, 70, 80 hour weeks. It was common, by the way, for children uh, to work. Uh, child labor was not, uh, you know, was, was not created by the Industrial Revolution. It was essentially inherited. Um, Might have exacerbated it in the, in the early Industrial Revolution, but ultimately um, industry and mechanization was the solution to child labor. I mean, child labor wasn't even seen as a problem. Right. It was just, it was just a fact of life. Kids, yes. you know, on a farm, kids would start working as early as they were able, you know, to, to lift something or sweep something. So uh, just the fact today that we even have all these years of our lives to, uh, to spend in education uh, and, and that, you know, literacy rates is another thing you can look at. Go to ourworldanddata.org and look up uh, literacy and you will see the rise of global literacy and the increasing, by the way, gender equality of literacy as more as uh, girls are getting taught to read and write uh, at an even faster rate uh, than boys are, um, or, or they're, they're catching up uh, to, to literacy rates, which is a good thing. Uh, so, um, yeah, so just so, so even the, the time that we have on the evenings and weekends, the time that we have as a child, the very idea of vacation, um, let alone paid vacation, right? Uh, the idea of retirement, which was not always a thing, um, you know, it used to be you, you worked until you died because there just wasn't, you, know, you didn't have enough surplus to save for retirement. Um, so, you know, all of these different things uh, give us time to spend with our families, to spend in leisure, to spend uh, in contemplation, or to spend reading and uh, listening and watching, uh, to spend outdoors in nature, to pursue uh, hobbies and, and side projects and all of this comes from leisure, but leisure comes from, uh, from, from wealth. It comes from, and the wealth comes from uh, a lot of it came from, you know, it comes from science, technology, and, and automation. Um, what, one thing I've been thinking about recently because I'm putting together this material for the high school program is, uh, automation of manufacturing. And the simple fact is that when you make a machine to do something, you know, to make something that you used to have to make by hand, the machine typically makes it faster. That's a lot of why you make the machine. And, uh, and, that, and simply put, that saves you time. And time is life, right? Time is the only non-renewable resource that we have. Um, at least not until we have better anti-aging technology. Then maybe it becomes a yeah. renewable resource. We'll see. Sounds good. Um, yeah, well, anyway, in any case, you end that the whole Twitter thread with, if you wonder why I'm divided, devoting full time to studying and promoting human progress, this is it. We need it badly. Because all you're talking about, I can hear right now, is just people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I mean, not in everybody. I hope not. But I see it a lot in my classes and people just in general when I talk and there's just the general air of pessimism and uh, feeling in the world is because they, I think they don't know or appreciate the history. Um, but um, there is something to look forward to in this regard. It's uh, your Progress Studies for Young Scholars program. Can you tell us about that program? Um, seems very exciting. What is it? Yeah, absolutely. So Progress Studies for Young Scholars, uh, which you can find online at progressstudies.school, is uh, an online summer program in the history of technology aimed at a high school audience. Um, okay. So it is aimed at high schoolers. We've gotten, by the way, a lot of interest from older students and, and adults. So the first thing I'll say is yes, we are putting something together for older students and adults as well. So uh, if you're if you're beyond high school, please go ahead and sign up. 
Uh, the course runs for six weeks. It's about a two hour a day commitment. We do uh, an hour a day of live discussion with an instructor, a uh, discussion and Q and A. And then uh, each day the students are given about an hour of material to read, uh, watch and listen to on their own before the next day's discussion. We're covering uh, a, a, a variety of topics, all from the history of technology. Uh, the, the complete history of technology is too much to do uh, thoroughly. So instead, we're, we're giving sort of an overview and a framework, and we are doing a number of, uh, of case studies uh, from the history of technology in depth and sort of indicating uh, more briefly uh, other topics. So we begin by doing a couple of days on the history of global living standards, just what we've been talking about, how much life has gotten better over the last couple hundred years, and how much that's really a historical anomaly, how slow progress was for tens of thousands of years and, and, and longer. Um, and then once we've learned to appreciate, okay, yeah, there's something, some big phenomenon here, then we go into, all right, how did we do it? What were the big um, innovations, inventions, improvements, and discoveries? And we organize the course around challenges of, of life and work, daily, daily challenges that we faced, problems, and how we solved them. Things like, uh, challenges like making things, feeding ourselves, getting around, right, which you can map to manufacturing, agriculture, transportation. Uh, then we stop to look at a technology that is fundamental to all of these, which is energy. Uh, then we move on to look at a couple of other uh, important challenges, uh, getting sick, infectious disease in particular, uh, as a highlight of, of, of medical technology, and then uh, information, handling information, and a lot of the stuff we've been talking about ultimately with, with electronic communications, ultimately culminating in computers and the internet. Um, finally, the last major topic we look at is safety the hazards and the risks, both hazards of nature and hazards of technology. Um, and sometimes uh, the, the two go together or, or one exacerbates the other. Uh, and how have we dealt with those uh, hazards in the past and, and how has life actually become safer? And then finally, we wrap up by looking at the future. So the, the purpose of the course really is not just to look at the past, but to use the past to understand the present and to think about where we're going in the future. I want the students to come away seeing uh, this, uh, the present moment as a point in time, but a point in context and a point that has not only a position, but also a velocity. It has a direction and a speed. And uh, we can see that velocity by looking at the past and, and where we've been up until now. And then we can project forward as to where things might go in the future. And the class is really going to encourage and challenge the students to think about what part they want to play uh, in that in that history. Um, the speaker series that goes along with the class, which by the way is, is open to everyone and I uh, encourage everybody to sign up. The speaker series is called The Torch of Progress. And we called it, we picked that name because of the idea that every generation needs to pick up that torch uh, and to, you know, to, to, to hand it over from the, from the last generation, pick up that torch uh, and carry it forward. Progress doesn't happen uh, without choice and effort, without us deciding uh, to make it happen and then putting in the work to move it forward. So that's what we want the next generation to do. Wow. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, how did it get started? And what, what I mean is like, did it spring from your other work or why did you decide to organize this thing and how do you organize such a thing? Yeah, sure. So this is a joint project uh, between uh, the Roots of Progress, my brand, and uh, Higher Ground Education. Higher Ground is the largest operator of Montessori and Montessori-inspired schools yeah. in the United States. Uh, they have a network uh, of Montessori schools for younger children called Guidepost Montessori. And then they have um, a high school, Montessori-inspired high school called the Academy of Thought and Industry. Uh, the folks who founded and, and run that company are uh, people I've actually known for a long time and have deep respect for. We've been looking for an excuse to work together ever since I got going full time on progress. And uh, they're actually the ones who reached out to me a little over a month ago and suggested, hey, how about we do a, an online summer program aimed at high schoolers? And uh, I jumped at the chance. So, so they uh, operate and own the course. Um, I'm creating it uh, for, for them and with them and we're running it together. Um, I'm the instructor for the first uh, class, and then we're recruiting together, recruiting and training other instructors to run uh, subsequent classes, which are starting every week or two. And right. so uh, that's really how it came together and how it's being run. Well, it's all very exciting. Um, I, you probably get this question a lot, I imagine, but it's very important to tie it all together here. What is 
progress? How do you define that word? Because you're about the roots of progress and all that. And why is it a, why is progress studies a moral imperative, as you say? Yeah, sure. Um, I define progress fundamentally by a humanistic standard. So progress is anything that helps us live better lives, healthy, that makes us healthier, happier, more able to understand and control our world. Um, anything that increases our stock of knowledge or enriches our spiritual life, anything that com- uh, contributes to peace, freedom, universal rights, um, anything that makes us, uh, you know, richer uh, and, and you know, wealthier, um, anything that helps us uh, shrink the world, both in, you know, in space and time, uh, all, all of these things sort of just making human lives better on, on all these different axes. Uh, and anything that contributes to that is part of progress. Broadly, I think of progress in kind of three uh, main categories. Technological and industrial progress, economic progress is one category. Uh, that's the one that I mostly focus on these days in, in my research and writing. Uh, scientific progress, or more broadly, the uh, progress in the advance of knowledge, uh, both the frontiers of knowledge and the distribution of knowledge through communication and education uh, is another area. And then the third would be progress in, uh, morality and society and government. Uh, and so these three, three areas, what we can do, what we know, and then sort of morality and how we get along. Those three areas are really, I think, uh, in, 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 intertwined and, and, and cannot be separated in the overall human story of progress over the last you know centuries and millennia. All right. Okay. So if those, if those uh, components are kind of the roots of progress, we might say, what threatens progress, do you think? Yeah. I think the biggest threat to progress is simply people taking it for granted, not appreciating it, not even knowing that it's happened, not knowing how far we've come uh, or how much it would suck to be knocked back, you know, to the world of say yeah. 1700 or even 1800. Um, I think so the, the first thing we simply need to do is make people aware, just tell the story. Um, how, how, how far have we come? How did we get here? How much of an achievement that was? And again, how much of a historical anomaly it is? Uh, you know, if you, if you look at these charts, right, they, they just, they go like this and then they, sh- they shoot up, uh, right around 1800, uh, Deirdre McCluskey calls it the great enrichment. And it's a phenomenon that just everybody needs, needs to know about. Um, I think that's the fundamental thing. I think, uh, the, and and I think if people, more people knew about that and, and appreciated it, then I think more people would care about the, about the actual, the the roots as in the root causes, right? The deepest causes of progress, understanding and appreciating science, uh, and the, the, the development and growth of science invention, uh, you know, encouraging that, um, in one of Tyler Cowen's, so Tyler Cowen wrote a book almost a decade ago called The Great Stagnation, where he was warning about this slowdown in progress. And one of his prescriptions was raise the quote unquote social status of science and technology. You know, mm-hmm. Bring back the, the prestige and the acclaim uh, and the, you know, the general high regard that those things were held. And um, I, I, I think it's true. I think we need to do that. And I think in order to do that, also, I think people's fears about technology need to be put in proper context. Um, I think too often fears and even legitimate uh, fears about technology are uh, put in a context that what we should do is slam the brakes on technology um, slam and, 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 and uh, put, a, put a damper on, on science and tech and progress. And I think that the actual lesson of, uh, of safety throughout history is that what brings safety is not a slowdown in technology, but actually an acceleration in a particular kind of technology, which we'll just call safety technology. Mm-hmm. Safety itself is an achievement. Uh, safety itself is an area of technology, or at least it is a it is an area within each major uh, you know branch of technology, and uh, it is something that we can achieve through the same means that we achieve every other value. Just as we achieve speed, as we achieve wealth, as we achieve health, uh, we can also achieve uh, cleanliness and comfort and safety and reliability. Um, all of these things are just different values to be engineered and to be traded off against one another. So, um, you know, I wish more of the, this, I guess this is my, my, I, I wish more of the conversation around safety 
was around safety technology, not around what, what should we stop doing or refrain from doing in order to achieve safety, but rather what can we positively do? What are the, what are the, the positive steps to take? What are the things to invent and to discover that will make us safer? Because it's invention and discovery that has, that has made us uh, much, much safer now than we've ever been uh, you know, than, than, than we were hundreds of years ago, at least from, you know, most of the things, most of the dangers that we've faced throughout most of human history. Right. The idea is not, oh, this thing creates new problems. So let's just stop doing the thing. It's, it's a create a new problem, but let's use more technology to, to keep this thing. That's a real boon to, to our, our lives and then to use technology and, and innovation to help with the problem. And then from yeah. there, you might get a little smaller problem, but just way better problems. You know, David money- Deutsch in his book, uh, in, in the book, in the beginning of infinity, David Deutsch points out that pro- solving problems always and necessarily creates new problems. Okay. This is not to point this out is not an indictment of problem solving any more than it's an indictment of science to point out that answering questions raises new questions. Mm-hmm. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't get mad at scientists when their, their theories <laughs> that explain some part of the world open up new questions. We actually celebrate that. That is the opening of new frontiers. Um, it's, it's an expansion, you know, the, the, the creation of new questions is the expansion of our knowledge, uh, rather than, uh, you know, rather than some evidence that science somehow isn't working. And, and by a perfect analogy, uh, the creation of new problems is not uh, evidence that we're regressing somehow. It's actually, uh, it's actually evidence of progress. Um, and so, yes, the, the, the new problems are almost always uh, better problems to have than the old ones were. And the new problems are to be solved not by rolling back, but by rolling forward, by moving forward with, with new technology to solve the new problems. Uh, almost, almost all the time. Yeah, right. Okay. That's excellent again, Jason. Um, uh, finally, finally, to go back to that uh, Twitter thread, just to bring it to a new point, um, you said, as a side note, this is part of why I say that money is underrated and is, in fact, one of the greatest known forces for social good. And we know money has a bad rap, right? We, we hear that it's the root of all evil. Um, even in the context of this, uh, uh, this pandemic, people refer, talk about the economy versus lives as if the economy is something that's apart from encounter to lives or something. Um, it's just money and all that. So why does money have a bad rap, do you think? And, and what should a proper view of money be? Yeah. Wow. That's a big question. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, money has almost always had a bad rap. Like you go back to, or, you know, certainly at least back to the time of Christ. Um, so it goes back thousands of years, right? You know, who, who was it that Christ chased from the temple? It was, it was the money lenders, right? Um, so, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a very, very old problem. Um, and, uh, you know, so why do I say that money is actually a force for social good? I think the simplest, you know, the simplest fact is that money isn't prejudiced. Um, yes. money is this, uh, sort of great leveler, right? It, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, my, the only color money cares about is green, right? To, He's a very U.S. centric, you know, uh, an analogy, right, or, or, okay. or metaphor. Um, money doesn't uh, doesn't care what race you are. It doesn't care what religion you are. It doesn't care who you date or marry. Um, it doesn't care what music you like or what clothes you wear. You know, in the end, everybody's money is green, and people who really care about money are going to do business with, um, you know, with with all sorts of uh, uh, of people, regardless of whether it's the people that their culture, you know, says, um, are, are good people. Uh, there's some really excellent, um, I've read some really excellent news stories, um, on this one was in the New York times from gosh, about a decade ago, or maybe, maybe more, uh, talking about, uh, caste systems and how they were, um, there's, there's actually two articles I think I've read about, um, how caste systems are sort of being eroded by capitalism. Um, and, and, you know, and I think this is a very good thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, money has, has been a liberation for women as, uh, as, as capitalism has made it possible for women to be more independent, to be able to live on their own without, you know, needing a man to have a, a life that's not full of hardship. And we've done that through inventions that, that, you know, mechanical inventions, by the way, level the playing field of uh, physical strength. So, which, which is a great equalizer among the sexes. Um, and so the, you know, the ability to, and, and we see this in global development too, as countries become richer, um, 
they're, you know, women are able to live more independent lives um, and, are, and are able to pursue what they want to pursue. They're able to marry whom they want to marry. They're able to have careers if they want to have careers. Um, uh, and so I, I, I just think there's, there's all of these different ways in which um, money is a force for social good. And it's generally underrated because of the kind of just the general cultural bias against money that yeah, sees money as evil. That's right. It's, it's just too bad. Um, especially, um, I'm going to move into funding now. Uh, you're very interested in, in the funding models, the importance of funding models. And what I've read of yours is quite fascinating to me. And, uh, you know, I see that it's very underappreciated, uh, it's an underappreciated value in progress. Um, and of course, progress we're saying here means human enrichment and empowerment, material and spiritual. So, um, I guess what are, I guess, what are the, some of the lessons we might induce from funding over history and what is the importance of funding, I guess, to start broadly or should I can bring yeah, you more specific sure. if you want? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, let me, let me just start with an introduction to that subject. I think, um, the simple lessons from looking at the history of progress are that, uh, so progress is not automatic even when the scientific uh, underpinnings for an invention, for instance, are known and in place, the invention doesn't happen automatically. Even when an invention has been created, the business that distributes that invention doesn't happen automatically, isn't created automatically. Every step is a new step that needs to be taken and moved forward uh, by people with, with work and effort uh, and time, uh, blood, sweat, and tears. And also every step entails risk. The fact that the scientific uh, underpinning for, you know, the fact that the, that electricity, uh, the, so the physics of electricity has been discovered does not mean that it's obvious that the electric telegraph can be created or that the electric motor can be invented or that it would work or that electric light bulbs uh, are going to be practical, et cetera. Um, all of those things entail risk and entail solving new challenges. Um, and again, once you've invented the electric motor, it's not obvious that there's going to be a market for it and it's not obvious what the right business model is and so forth. So, um, at every step there's work to be done and there's uncertainties and risk. Um, and because of that, every step requires funding, uh, requires material resources, uh, to, if nothing else, to pay for the time uh, and the, the living of the people who are doing the work, uh, and also often to pay for materials, to pay for capital investment, and so forth. Um, so progress requires funding. It doesn't happen automatically. And then I think the other thing that we can... Uh, so, so one simple, uh, obvious lesson of that is the value of surplus. Um, the more surplus we create in the economy of any kind, the more we've got extra resources sitting around to uh, invest in the future, to invest in progress and innovation. The other thing that I think you see from the history of progress is that even when surplus exists, it is not automatically allocated to the most promising and productive uses, especially in hindsight. Um, so a simple story around this is the story of penicillin. Um, penicillin was one of the first really powerful antibiotics, not the very first, uh, but, but really it was a, it was a game changer in, in medicine. And uh, penicillin was the, the, the action of, of penicillin as a, as a microbiological discovery, a scientific discovery occurred in 1928 with Alexander Fleming's uh, discovery in a Petri dish that a certain type of mold uh, was repelling or, or was, was killing bacteria. The first clinical trials of penicillin were not performed until 1941, over a decade later. Um, and a lot of that is because the, the penicillin discovery essentially sat on the shelf for about a decade um, in between you know, Fleming's discovery and his initial attempts to try to do something with it. And then several years later, uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it had been sort of put on the, sh put on the shelf, um, pretty much literally, you know, Fleming had uh, samples of the mold around that he was willing to give out to anybody who wanted to experiment with it, um, uh, for which he deserves eternal credit for just for simply doing that, right. you know, but he didn't know what to do with it. The fact is that simply discovering the mold doesn't get you the drug. Um, penicillin as a drug, by the way, is not a, it's not a mold. It's not as if you just inject the mold into people's veins or feed it to them. That okay. doesn't work. The pe penicillin, the drug, is a chemical excreted by the mold. And uh, what you need to do is extract that chemical and purify it. Uh, and doing so is a, is a chemical engineering process which needed to be uh, invented. 
Uh, and Fleming was not the one to do that. He wasn't a chemist. He was a microbiologist. And it turns out that penicillin as a chemical is actually quite difficult to work with. It's easy to break down. Uh, it, it, it easily, you know, uh, decomposes. And so uh, it was Howard Florey's lab in Oxford that actually did the work to figure out the chemical process to extract penicillin and then ran the clinical trials and proved that it worked. And then it was actually uh, the U.S., uh, a lot of U.S. government labs during World War II that took this process and scaled it up to industrial levels to do more um, trials and ultimately to turn it into a drug that could be used first for the for the military because it was again it's during World War II and then expanding it you know to the general population and even by the way Howard Florey's lab when they picked up this project uh, again about a decade after Fleming's original experiment Howard Florey's lab was dramatically underfunded they were scraping together donations of a few hundred pounds here and there in you know 1940s money uh, to just keep the lights on you know keep the heat running literally to, uh, they were cribbing supplies from the cafeteria, like metal trays. They had so little penicillin that they were working with that they were literally uh, collecting urine from the patients and extracting the penicillin from the urine to recycle it um, because it would just go through the body. Um, and then, and, you know, that was, that was what they needed to do because it was so difficult to make at the time. Um, they had a hard time getting factories in Britain to manufacture it because all the factories were busy with war work, right? With... I mean, not that, by the way, penicillin ultimately would be seen as very valuable war work, but it wasn't obvious at the time because it was just still in the experimental stage and all the factories needed to make things that were more obviously needed for the war effort. So it was really the surplus capacity of the United States um, that, was, that was extremely helpful there. So all of this just shows that, uh, you know, if you, could, if you had a crystal ball in 1940 or even 1928 and you could sort of predict which, which technologies that had not yet been fully developed were going to change the world, you know, your, your alarm bells would be going off at, at level nine or 10 mm -hmm. for, for penicillin, right? right. You, you would have been screaming at the whole world. Now focus on this, fund this, get the money over here. Let's just get this thing done. Yes. But nobody knew that at the time. And arguably they could not have known it even with the best, um, you know, even, even with the best of intentions and processes. Mm -hmm. And so I just think all of this says funding for progress is, is extremely important and funding mechanisms are extremely important. And so it would make a lot of sense for us to examine the ones that we have um, and ask whether we have the right ones and the right portfolio of dollars, uh, you know, allocated to all these different mechanisms. If you just, even, if you even just look at U.S. funding today uh, for, for research, uh, government funding for research, you have approaches as diverse as, say, the NIH and DARPA. Whereas on the one hand, NIH uh, funds things largely through a sort of peer review driven process, a committee of your peers uh, who review proposals, score them, average the scores, debate in committee and, and so forth, to on the other end of the spectrum, which has certain virtues and advantages, although on the, on the other hand, you can also imagine a lot of uh, uh, you know, ability for consensus and groupthink to to creep in and and perhaps drive out contrarian sort of maverick, uh, yeah. you know, wacky high risk high reward ideas. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got something like DARPA, uh, which takes a program manager who come on for a, a a tour of duty, you know, three to five years, and have uh, you know pretty much sole control over a sizable budget to contract out for again high risk high reward ideas. Um, that are, and, and, and DARPA explicitly kind of sees their role and their goal as funding things that nobody else is going to fund, make things happen that, that wouldn't otherwise have happened or that would have taken much, much longer to happen. And literally they see their role as changing people's minds about what's possible. Okay. Um, and so it's just a very different, and I'm not even saying necessarily that one of these is better or worse than the other. Maybe we need both. Maybe we need a portfolio uh, of allocation to them. But I think these different models uh, are, are uh, to, to harken back to uh, the article in The Atlantic from Tyler Cowen and Patrick Collison that kicked yeah. off the whole progress studies movement. These models are understudied, right? And there's sort of not enough attention paid to them and not enough people asking and answering the question of, do we have the right set of, of funding models and mechanisms? And do we have the right portfolio allocation of dollars? Why does NIH have a budget of 41 billion and DARPA, you know, have a budget of, a, of maybe what, three, three or four billion and the NSF have seven and a half billion. And somebody just proposed, by the way, that we should ramp up the funding of NSF and give it an extra hundred million dollars of the next five, or sorry, hundred billion dollars of the next five years 
years, ramping its budget up to, you know, almost the level of NIH. And that is at the same time, NSF should take on more uh, responsibility for technology rather than sort of quote unquote pure basic research. Is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? I think we should have, you know, a sort of robust literature of, uh, you know, understanding and studying these effects to even be able to begin to address those questions. All right. Well, and and that's a big area of your interest. Um, one one, ca- one uh, categorization you could make would be nonprofit versus profit models, like a very broad one, to try to bring it down here a bit. Um, what are, I guess, some of the pros and cons of various nonprofit and um, profit models, maybe, is a, a good general question. You seem to be just, yeah. I just wind you up and you go off. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, well, I actually wrote a whole essay about this uh, recently about different types of funding models and about, in general, sort of um, uh, pros and cons of uh, nonprofit and for profit models. Um, I see I see some very deep advantages to for profit models. In fact, I I put out this uh, sort of bold thesis that essentially anything that can be for profit should be. That doesn't mean everything can be. <laughs> uh, I think there are a lot of things that really can't be done very well with for-profit models. And so there's a, there's, there's plenty of room for nonprofit. Um, but the, the beauty about a for-profit models where they're possible and make sense is the way that they uh, uh, keep you honest and align incentives. When you, so and there's, I, and I identified in that essay two basic feedback loops um, that, that yeah. do this. One of them is the simple feedback loop that if you are charging money for a product or service, then you, uh, you essentially need to prove in reality that your product or service is valuable um, to people at a certain level of value and that it's valuable to a large enough you know, market. Uh, and you prove that through your revenue, right? People are, people are willing to buy uh, your product and service. They're not forced to, presumably. They have options, hopefully, if you're not um, if you're not in a, uh, maybe if you haven't been, you know, granted a monopoly by some government agency. Uh, and so, you know, now you've actually got to prove your worth out there in the marketplace. But the other uh, feedback loop is in what projects even get investment to be created in the first place. Um, and this is a, uh, a feedback loop where, you know, investors put in uh, money and ultimately they get money back as a return. And so, uh, again, you've got to prove uh, you know, investors have to prove over time that they know how to allocate resources by actually showing over time that they're getting a return from those resources. Um, if they, you know, the more that they correctly uh, allocate or the more they, the more good bets they make, uh, the more resources they get to, uh, to continue investing with and the more they lose, the more they don't have any resources to, to throw around anymore. So those two feedback loops, I think are extremely important and they have a few, um, a few other sort of uh, ramifications that might not be super obvious. So one of the one of the great benefits of uh, charging for your services is that no, is that your your operations can scale with your market size. Essentially, they can scale with demand because the revenue for the operations is coming directly from the demand. Um, if you are a, a sort of in a pure charity model. Um, right. The problem with, with pure charity models is that you cannot necessarily scale your operations to provide what you provide to everybody who, who, who wants or needs it uh, because the money's not coming from them. It's coming from some third party who, uh, you know, is just not directly connected. Um, again, not to say the charity shouldn't exist. Obviously, it exists exactly to fill in those holes where that can't happen. But um, if you have two models of being able to provide a value and one of them is self-sustaining and self-scaling because you're charging directly for your services and the other is not because it depends on charity, I, I submit that the self-sustaining and self-scaling you know, version has that you know, very strong advantage. And then the other thing I sort of point out is that, um, uh, well, actually, okay, actually two other things. One thing is that okay. the, um, the ability to quantify value at all parts of these feedback loops Mm -hmm. uh, allows you to bring in a, an entire toolbox of metrics and, uh, and, and mathematical analysis and optimization. And in fact, we have an entire discipline and profession around this. It's called accounting. And so financial metrics really let you, um, optimize things for effectiveness and efficiency, um, in a way that, that I think nothing else does. And just to sort of move on quickly, the, the, the last thing that I think is really underappreciated is on the investing side, that investing feedback loop. Yeah. Um, for-profit investing aligns incentives in that 
Uh, it encourages high risk, high reward bets. Um, and it encourages uh, sort of contrarian uh, bets. So it encourages investors to seek out uh, investment theses that no one else believes in and to, to, to invest in things that no one else wants to invest in. Um, and this is sort of the opposite of how nonprofit funding generally works. People um, are much more kind of consensus seeking in the nonprofit world. They're see because they're not seeking a financial return. They're seeking uh, acclaim. They're seeking prestige. They're seeking approval of others. Um, you know, not always, but but very often. And so, if you think about risk profile, the risk profile of new experiments is generally strongly asymmetric upside, limited downside. You try an experiment, usually the worst thing that happens is you just waste all of the resources that you put into that experiment. You just lose all the money. You lose 1x the money that you put in. But the upside of an experiment can be hundreds or thousands of times uh, return on the, on the resources that went into it. And this is true whether it's a business and the returns are directly returns to the, to the founders and the investors, or whether it's a, a science experiment and the returns are, uh, are, are not captured directly, but, but accrue to society at large. Um, so you've got this, this huge upside, limited downside. Unfortunate, and, and when you are a for-profit investor, again, it's pretty much the same way. The worst that happens is you lose all your money. The best is you can make, you know, a thousand X return. Unfortunately, with nonprofit funding, I'm afraid that the risk profile uh, is inverted. If you, you know, the best thing that can happen is you get some prestige, but if you were, uh, but if you backed the thing that had a thousand X return to society, you don't really get a thousand X the prestige. Um, you don't get a thousand X the acclaim or, or, uh, 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 you know, or, or the, the, the lauding of, of society. Um, uh, and in particular, you don't get a thousand X for being right early, for being the backer who backed the thing when nobody else believed in it. Um, nobody else really remembers that you were the one who believed when it seemed to everybody else to be like a crazy idea. And, and therefore, everybody wants to glom onto things after they're already successful, which is exactly when they don't need, you know, the resources nearly as badly. But on the downside, I'm afraid we have more asymmetric downside risk because if you do back the crazy thing and it doesn't work out, I think it's much more common for that to be, uh, you know, to, to just kind of ruin your reputation or your career or mm -hmm. to look really bad or really stupid. Um, and we've fixed that in investing just through the culture. Nobody, nobody in investing really cares about your flops. Nobody cares if you made a, a, a bet certainly if it was a small bet, like an early seed stage investment mm -hmm. on something that turned out to be stupid or, or crazy or just, or just flopped or, or blew up. Um, but in the nonprofit world, I think there's much more of a worry that if you back something that looks stupid or crazy, it could be even a career ending move. And so we've got the risk profile just absolutely backwards in nonprofit. And I think we've got to find a way to flip those incentives to make it more like for-profit investing so that you've got limited downside and asymmetric upside, which corresponds with the actual um, outcome and, and benefits of these experiments. Wow. All right. I mean, you just taken that uh, so, so deep and we're running a little low on time and um, we could go much deeper. I will link to those articles because I think just reading through the three of them, you're going to get a lot of that, but then um, a lot of other uh, information to kind of tie it all together. But if you have a little bit more time, I wouldn't mind moving into a last thing here because yeah, I think we're already over uh, our hour, but if you're all right for That's a few right. minutes. Yeah, let's, yeah, sure. Let's go ahead. Yeah. I'd like to take it, get a little bit of a personal because I always want to bring it back to now. I mean, if, if you're not sold that life is good, right? I don't know what else we can do for you after all of that. Um, and then more, but, but yet we still struggle on the personal level to take it and kind of appreciate it day to day. Um, so I want to just kind of, uh, try to throw some that at you for a few minutes here. If I want to lay it on you and see what you make of this. Um, sure. Yeah. And then we'll come back and I want to ask you about it. So in my framework um, of what I call objective optimism, a central component to it is appreciation. So um, it was what many people call gratitude. Um, and I'm interested in people appreciating the starting point we're at in, in life and feeling rich every day at the individual level, as I say. And I think a lot of people um, start with what's given today and then they feel kind of swamped and overwhelmed. It's almost like they can't get ahead like they say, and, and I, I want to ask ahead of what, and it's like they aren't getting in on or taking part in all the progress and they kind of just see scarcity mm -hmm. amidst all of what you've just told us. They still see that day to day in their life. They kind of mm -hmm. feel 
that they're not getting in on it. Um, but I always find it helpful to start with uh, like the real start, like the real just looking out at the, the, the trees, the rocks, the mountains. And I think one way to do this is I enjoy historical fiction and, or even fiction set in historical times, uh, particularly movies and uh, TV shows. So, so again, if you let me go with this uh, for a minute, um, if you think of something like Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones, you just, you know, you, you see the time and it doesn't really matter which one of these shows is because, I mean, when are they set? It, it could be thousands of years apart because pretty much anywhere before 300 years, it just all looks like that. Right. And then, you know, you, you can, you know, with the, just a couple of swords and that's it. And you could go more to something like a uh, hell on wheels or outlanders another show on Netflix. We can enjoy the, whatever your show is. They're a little more modern, but yet they're still unrecognizable to us today. Right. Um, and it just, this is what I mean when we, we say it's a very exceptional time in human history now. So I imagine sometimes like say Aragorn's like, you know, we're not going to leave Frodo and they just run off into the woods with a cape or something, right? And a few knives and you just wonder, and then they're running across mountains and they're just, what are they doing out there? Like, how could they, there's nothing there. And even if they do get to a city or something, they pull up to what's, what's a city. It's just people pushing carts around in a field and maybe a cobblestone. And even when they get to where the King's at, it's just this giant stone room and he's sitting in a chair at the back with a couple candles or something. Um, you know, going back to Game of Thrones, if I, again, you, you imagine like they're, they're traveling, the hounds travel or something. He stops at a tavern in the forest and there's just, you know, there's this dusty table and a stone room and maybe get an ale and a little bit of food, nothing like what we can enjoy today. You know, so you see that and you go, that was just life forever. You, you mentioned this, you know, on the graph. And then people might imagine themselves, well, no, but what about like the rich ones like Cersei Lannister or something like that? She's in the, you know, you might, first of all, we could put aside the idea that nobody is going to be her. But even if you were, they, they imagine, well, there was something. She has the gold goblet and drinking wine and it's all nice and flowers and looking out the window in an elaborate dress. But I ask at that point, what if she's, what if Cersei has to go to the bathroom? What does that look like? I mean, you don't want to go too far with it. What if, what if she wants to like go travel somewhere, go to another country, right? Even though she's the queen and she's the richest, right? What if she wants to go to another city? What if she wants to, you mentioned if they want to hear music, right? I mean, what would she do if she wanted to, um, you know, if she wanted to, if she got sick, imagine that in your, in your tweet, you mentioned some of the vaccines and antibiotics that have been invented, list them since 1973 and 78, maybe it was. And the list was just huge. That's set 1973. So imagine for her, I mean, it doesn't matter. You can see very quickly that it doesn't matter how rich any of them were at that time. And then you move forward to more modern times sometimes, again, with this fiction idea that I think of. And it's, you go to Anne with an E or something. That's this uh, Netflix series uh, with the Anna Green Gables stories. And most people are familiar with those. And you've got Matthew and Melissa, Melissa uh, Marilla, excuse me, Cuthbert, just out there all day, just doing what? Spend their whole day just getting enough so they can do the next day. And they accumulate a bit of wealth, you might say. And it's quite lovely, but they're not very empowered in terms of what we're talking about in terms of time. And then... I just ask, what would all those people want? Any of those people that we've, there were all these characters, what would they want? And in, in terms of getting ahead, what would they want to get ahead of? And, you know, what would they, you know, what would they, they'd want to be fed. They'd want to be sheltered. They'd want to be cooled in the winter or in the, in the, the summer and warmed in the winter. They'd want to feel free from disease and injury. They would want to stop fighting. Those guys are just fighting all the time. That's all they're doing. Um, They'd want to get to where they're going faster, more safely, et cetera. And of course I could go on too, just like you. <laughs> um, but I get to myself and this is where it ends. So I get to myself in the day and I just sit there with my coffee and I look around at my home and I just feel rich. I feel like that's all solved. All those problems, the whole problem that they're dealing with, I'm way ahead of that. I'm at a whole different starting point. And what can I do from here to to build a better life, but not feel poor in this case, if you know what I mean. So, um, like I, I feel abundance, I guess what I'm saying versus scarcity. And then, um, I say that, so what do you make of that? First of all, does it sound like, do you, and do you ever like do anything like that similar and how do you express or connect with your appreciation in your personal life, like day to day? Yeah. Um, I, so first off, I think your, your perspective is absolutely right in terms of the benefits that we enjoy and how those are, you know, in, in, there are things accessible to, you know, almost everyone today that were, uh, you know, that were not accessible even to royalty 
um, a few hundred years ago. In fact, um, I can think of one thing that is literally uh, uh, a benefit that absolutely everyone, including the absolute poorest person on earth, uh, single single poorest person on earth, enjoys today that uh, you know kings and, and emperors uh, did not, and that is freedom from smallpox. And that is because smallpox is uh, the one disease that we have uh, eradicated completely, wiped it off the face of the earth. The only smallpox viruses that exist anymore are, uh, you know, in a couple of, uh, that, are, that are known at least are in a couple of, you know, laboratories for, uh, for study. And those are extremely, um, you know, hopefully well guarded and, and protected. But there is no wild smallpox. There has not been a case of smallpox for over 40 years. Um, and so that's a thing that, you know, and it, and it used to be that, um, uh, again, that, that even royalty was not, was not free from this, uh, and, and could die of it. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just, that's one small way that, uh, I'm not saying I'd rather be the absolute poorest person on earth today versus a, a king of old. Um, but it is true by the way, that, um, absolutely every country on earth today has an average, uh, life expectancy that is higher than any country on earth had uh, in 1800. Um, so that's one way in which, uh, you know, progress has been raised really across the board. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, your approach of, uh, of re both reading history, uh, learning history, and also experiencing historical fiction um, and I don't think I would exactly put Lord of the Rings in the category of historical fiction, but no, no, uh, <laughs> fic fiction that's set in some kind of pastime. I added, yes. I thought, yes, yeah. it was, of course. You know, I mean, medieval fantasies like that obviously are inspired by medieval history, but uh, you know, but if you look at more at, at more realistic uh, sort mm -hmm. of things that are set in historical ages, I think it's a great way to just um, just sort of experience in a in a very visceral way, in a in a in a vivid uh, firsthand way. You know what it, what life was like, um, and what were the challenges. And, uh, yeah. And so many of these dramas, um, you know, revolve around, uh, medical problems that are just solved today, you know, or just, mm -hmm. or just extremely rare. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I guess, yeah, I don't want to go too far. Maybe just one out of all of this then, because, uh, yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll get it. We'll wrap it up pretty soon here. Um, I think maybe one, one problem that people might see, and I kind of see in the world again, when I'm trying to um, think about it and help solve it a bit, is that um, self-esteem is a crucial component to happiness, right? It's founded on integrity. Um, and I think appreciation is a very necessary key, but not really a foundational one as much as self-esteem. And we get our self-esteem from creation and production, right? And when we talk about Marilla and Matthew and all that, and all that, all that stuff's done for us. All the work is done. And you say the work, work week and we can just sit back and we can go on holidays and all this free time we have, we're mostly spending a lot of our time consuming and not so much producing. And then people will then go and look to tech and say, well, you've stripped me of my productive purpose or something. And, and if, I mean, what can we say to that? And where, where can someone go from here at this great start? I mean, how should we be thinking about that? Do you, do you see that yeah. at all? And Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, technology has given us more leisure than anyone has had mm. in the past. And um, it's up to us what we do with that. Technology in general is a power. It's a capability. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is in its of itself, it's amoral. It's, it's, it's non-moral, yes. neither, neither good nor evil. It's just a power and it's how we use it that matters. So technology can be used for good or for evil and it can be used uh, to make our lives better or worse. And, uh, the, and the, the increase in leisure is, is a case of that. We can use the leisure to make our lives better um, by using it for, uh, for things that are fulfilling and enriching things that will be happy in retrospect that we spent it on. Um, or we can use it to make our lives worse by, um, indulging in unhealthy habits. Um, I think that, you know, there, there are many productive ways to use leisure or, you know, there, there are many ways to use leisure to build a better life. Um, and one of them is simply, uh, it, you know, spending it on recreation and uh, social time that, you are going to look back on and be glad that you did spend it with good friends and, and family you love, spend it in um, contemplation and learning in, in art, um, you know, and not just in sort of uh, um, 
uh, in, indulging in, um, you know, things that are sort of more short-term pleasures or uh, doom scrolling on Facebook uh, and Twitter or, uh, you know, consuming the sort of art equivalent of junk food, right? And it's okay to do a little bit of that stuff, you know, but just to like, don't make it all your leisure time, right? There are other ways to use that extra time as well. One thing is to not use, uh, is to not turn into leisure and to work more. And people who have uh, really intense uh, careers that they love and get a lot of value out of, some of them choose not to work a 40 hour week. Um, I don't, you know, uh, even a few of them maybe go up to that 70 or 80 hours that their ancestors might have worked. Yeah. Um, and, and others strike a balance and say, actually, I'm going to do, you know, 50, 60 hours a week. Uh, and I, you know, I see that as a very personal decision, um, not a moral decision, a very personal decision to be made carefully and with knowledge of your of your values and your trade-offs. But some people who really uh, are, are just ambitious or love their jobs and their job is not maybe physically demanding, it's not manual labor, but is, but is mental labor that actually can, you know, pay dividends the more you do it um, and, and, and energize you rather than drain you, those people choose to use the extra time working. Mm -hmm. um, you can also use the extra time to engage in something productive that doesn't or does not yet earn you money. So um, one, of the, one of the best things about the labor market uh, today is that you can actually earn your living in maybe, especially if you're willing to live frugally, you can earn your living less than 40 hours. Maybe you can spend 20 or 30 hours, uh, pay enough for, uh, for a cheap apartment if you don't have too many dependents to support and so forth, and you're willing to kind of live on a budget. And then you spend the rest of the time uh, either pursuing some uh, maybe artistic uh, passion or pursuit, uh, and, and in, a, in a creative uh, way that, that again, doesn't earn you money or maybe just you haven't yet, you know, made it to the point where you can do that full time or you use it to build a business. Um, I remember, uh, you know, I've been in, I've been in Uber rides where I asked the Uber driver, Hey, what do you do? You know, do you drive Uber full time? He says, Oh no, I'm, you know, I'm using this to earn extra money so that I can build up my videography business and buy some equipment and get clients. And what I really want to do is be a full-time videographer. And great. So he's bootstrapping his way to, uh, to a better career. Um, and so those are all the different ways that you can sort of use the leisure time for good and not, uh, not squander it or, or turn it into something unhealthy. Wow. That's excellent. Thanks a lot, uh, Jason. But I can see now you can say that at least what we have is the, we're empowered to choose is the key in all that I would say. So I don't want to be blaming one, uh, you know, technology for our failure uh, to, to, to choose wrong. Um, you know, I guess uh, we might, uh, I guess we might have to wrap it up. We're getting uh, late on time. So I wonder if there's anything else you'd like to say before we sign up that I didn't really cover uh, that you're really hoping to get out. No, we've covered an enormous amount. I just asked people to uh, follow me, uh, find my website, rootsofprogress.org and subscribe to my email list and follow me on Twitter. I'm Jason Crawford on Twitter and uh, that site and Twitter are where I do most of my writing. All right. Excellent. So uh, before I just say a final word and sign off, I just want to tell the audience, please share this interview, uh, particularly with young people. I think, it, I mean, for anybody, but particularly for young people, I think uh, I deal with so many students and I just see they don't know these things. Um, I think the progress uh, studies for young scholars is one of the most exciting things going on. Uh, it's just from my, cause I see it all the time. This is one of, I think that lack of appreciation is, and, and which is, uh, bred from a lack of, uh, from ignorance, I guess, about the history of technology uh, is one component of that. Uh, so I'm very excited about it. Um, if you have questions for this, you can, um, I think the best place is go to the Facebook page, Matthew, uh, facebook.com slash matthewbolton.ca. If anything is directed towards Jason, I'll certainly make sure it gets redirected to him. Uh, maybe you'll come on the page if there's something there for you and answer some questions or something. Not sure. Um, and uh, you've mentioned where your your um, where people can find you. So I just want to let you know that I've enjoyed myself so much. Uh, I I was over overwhelmed a lot of time. You were basically just I was trying to keep everything together because you're just uh, going on. Um, I didn't have to lead you anywhere. And then I was like, well, what's the point of me? I don't you don't need me here. And I was getting where am I going to take this next? So I mean, you've delivered on what I hope to have you here for and. Um, you know, uh, anyway, I'd love to have you back another time. Maybe you can dive deeper into some of the particulars of technologies because I know you, some of the technology, I know you like to talk about that, but, um, thank you very much again. I very much appreciate it. Oh, this is uh, great. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for having me. All right. And to everybody else, 
life is good. And if you, ha if you haven't uh, been convinced of it now, then I don't know how else I can help you. So go out there and appreciate and enjoy the progress and abundance. And I'll see you guys next time. Mr. Brightside, your time out to refresh, refuel, and refocus your mind and energy toward building an optimistic framework for flourishing. Life is good. It's up to you to choose the bright side. Oh,